shifted upwards and outwards uh, to create a studio here uh, just across the driveway from my house. For years, I had studios in town. I started off having a studio, uh, a rented studio. Even when I was a student at PAPA, I rented a studio outside of school. Uh, I got the idea from Bo Bartlett, who had a studio at 7th and Chestnut. It was just an abandoned floor of a building. And I found one nearby that was the same situation, just a second story above a drugstore at 7th and Chestnut. No what, heat, no water, no toilet, but what beautiful. What year place. was that? What year was that? That mm -hmm. would have been 84, 1984. Wow. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there, I just rented one studio after another in Center City. What I'm always looking for, what's the most important ingredient in a studio for me is the light source. And I'll show you that. You can see the light on me, which is coming from a large window, which I'll show you when we tour the studio. Uh, so that Philadelphia works very well. There's a lot of old factory buildings that are set up. Basically, um, the grid of the city is, is on the compass so that just by walking around I could look up and calculate which buildings had windows facing a direction that would work for me and then I would just basically go and knock on doors and, and uh, ask about space within the building that I thought would work for me and, as and what said, direction is that north north so, so you like the north light the north is indirect so it's constant all day there's not direct sunlight that comes in that's very traditional that's the kind of light you would see in most any 16th, 17th century portrait or figure painting is that indirect light coming from basically a higher angle so that it, it comes downward very gently, uh, very beautiful for uh, soft transitions between lights and shadows, uh, shadows that aren't extremely dark and uh, a way of displaying color, especially in flesh, that is optimal. You can't see that so much in the zoom here. I think I probably look a little bit orangish, but this indirect light is in itself uh, poetic. And that is something that was always just fundamental to my working as a painter. I had to have that. It wouldn't have mattered how beautiful the space was if it didn't have that optimal light. So I was constantly through my youth trading really crappy spaces in order to have you know, really spaces that were very rough and sometimes unheated in order to have that perfect light or what I felt was perfect in terms of those big factory windows that you see in many buildings around Philadelphia. Then in Center City around 2003, 2004, there was an economic boom where all those factory buildings in Center City were suddenly uh, very attractive to developers for hotels and condominiums. So they were bought up very quickly and I needed another option. And I had always thought when we bought our house in 93 or 96, that someday maybe I could convert the garage to a studio. And finally in 2005, that idea had to happen. And so the studio was built in 2005 and um, it's been great. It's, it's not a large space compared to some of the studios I had in Center City. But it's all mine, and uh, it works uh, very well in terms of the lighting and uh, the space and the fact that I can control it. I'm not worried about will the heat work or not, or will the elevator be operating or not, um, et cetera. So having that control and having um, but the privacy has been really wonderful. So mm. That's where we are in that studio that was uh, used to be our garage. So did you put the window in yourself or did the garage already had a window? No, the garage didn't have a window. Let me show you, I'll, I'll try to be a little tour here. Let me see if I can uh, turn this around. Okay, so now I'm gonna back up from where I was and point you out the window. So we're backing to the front door of the studio and then you look up and there's the window. Oh, that looks like a skylight. Well, it's mounted above the roof in that area, but it's not, it's, it's, a, it's an almost perfectly vertical window. So it's like a dormer. Okay. So, so all the light comes in through there 
and that's the light that you are seeing on me. And then I'll show you how I've been working recently. I left the studio pretty much as was, so that here is, for example, the light on the easel, and you can see where I would set up the uh, the setup there, and you see the light that's even on just the glass on the table with the white drape. It's a very beautiful light. Mm -hmm. That's what's coming from the window that I just showed you, which is now behind me. Make sense? Yeah, totally. Uh, so since we've got that going, maybe I'll just show you around. So I'm going to back up now to the far corner of the studio. There's the front door where I just was. And now you can see sort of a, a panoramic view from underneath the far corner. And are those paintings up at the top? Yeah, I'm going to show you. So those, um, okay. you mean these? Yeah. Yeah, those are paintings. So what you see up there is essentially a kind of loft space where I store things, paintings that are finished, uh, paintings that sometimes I'm working on, mostly paintings that are finished, just getting them out of the way. And those um, three panels you see are paintings. They are, I guess you would call them Trump Loy paintings of reliefs from the Parthenon. Mm, mm -hmm. And those those three panels are um you see above them there's a, a that metal railing they slide back and forth so they're doors essentially mm. and um, so before there was no doors there it was just a loft and I got tired of looking at the chaos of the paintings and um, I conceived of having these doors or screens and then I decided I would make those reliefs on them so that was a lot of fun to paint those reliefs that's charming. Yeah, it's, it's kind beautiful. Of, it's like having a little piece of the Parthenon here in my studio. Mm -hmm. So then again, just panning around the studio, there's a painting of the Columbia Avenue Bridge. So I would say that uh, one of the things I've been working on this summer over the past few weeks are these florals that I am getting mostly from outside here, my, the garden my wife planted show you a little shot of that so out the window there's our garden so i just go out and cut some flowers from that and bring them in here and set them up on this table which is on wheels so i can slide it you know to and from out of the way and then there's a screen behind it which holds the drape and i set up the still lives like this one uh, there that was one from Monday. And then I have a bunch of those over here that have been accumulating. Oftentimes what happens is I, I hit upon either a subject matter and or a setting that I'm particularly liking and moved by. And then I just keep exploring it with all kinds of different arrangements of um, sometimes the same subjects or similar subjects because the possibilities are endless and each one has its own particular character. And I have come to feel that for myself at least, that even if the first one goes well and I think, oh, that was really a successful painting, I find later that I wish I had explored it further and done more uh, in the way of exploring all the possibilities of the arrangement of those items or um, getting items that are slightly different. You see the different canvas shapes. I've been experimenting a lot with how these small, uh, very delicate kind of garden bouquets uh, fit in the rectangle. So I've been increasing the size of the rectangle around the arrangements and enjoying that. And then I started sort of experimenting with the happenstance of the way the white drape just occurred when I had thrown it over the screen uh, as opposed to this. This was one of the first ones I did over the summer, this rose painting, which now to me looks too large in the rectangle. I suppose I wouldn't feel that way if it wasn't next to this one. <laughs> and then I have these down here, which I just was showing you a little bit of. Um, is this the first time you're going with a bright white background? 
from knowing your work, I'm just asking because you've worked so much with a deep, rich black background. Exactly. No, it's not the first time, but that gets back to what I was just saying that several years ago, excuse me, what happened there? Several years ago, I did uh, two, like, two paintings of some roses on this kind of white background. And at the time, I remember thinking, well, that was very successful. Wasn't that, wasn't that a good thing? And then I looked at those paintings a couple of years later and I thought, no, those aren't that great. I should have gone further. I should have experimented with this and that and the other thing. And so that's what I mean by when I, even when I find something I like, I want to keep going a little bit, especially when it's as available as this subject matter is. And all these paintings are basically one shot. You know, I work on them, they take about three hours. If I'm working on a larger figure painting, uh, you know, you can't just rattle them off and uh, be experimenting with variations, although I would like to do that too, but that would happen over years as opposed to over a few weeks. But in answer to your question, Vita, it's, um, I seem to like one extreme or the other. Uh, the dark backgrounds you're describing are something that I have picked up a lot from, or been influenced by 16th and 17th century Spanish still life and Italian still life. And I have come to realize that what I was doing with those, there's some of them over here I can show you, that what I was doing with those was sort of it, it, having that space function as a kind of dark void. Here, let me see if I can come into some of these. The space that was kind of a dark void surrounding the objects themselves. And I feel like the all white backgrounds have, I want to say, a similar kind of austerity to them, even though obviously it's completely inverse in that the background is very light. There is, um, I have to think about it, I don't know quite how to explain it to myself or to you, but there is a way that, uh, as I say, there's a similar kind of new universality to that white drape as I'm seeing it, conceiving of it. Okay, so I'll show you a little bit here. I'll just keep panning the studio, trying to give you an idea of the space, which of course is very hard to convey without being in it in this two-dimensional format. Garden scenes that I did several years ago, and I think the one I did that just out the window here, where I was just showing you painting those little yellow flowers was very enjoyable. I like that constellation of them against the dark of their own foliage, and um, it was some of that that I was remembering and thinking of in doing these new uh, floral. Um, what do I want to say, still lives. In other words, I'm bringing the flowers in and cutting them. So all of a sudden there's a, there's a fundamental difference in that the flowers become uh, clearly ephemeral, more so than in the garden scene. One influence to me about in these garden scenes was their painting by um, Antonio Lopez Garcia, where he painted, I think it was a rose and an iris and something else that were growing in his garden. And I just loved that painting. And before that, I had never really conceived of just going out in the garden and painting what happened to be there, you know, just finding uh, a moment in the garden and looking for the poetry within that. So here's the other wall. Um, going back to staying with our theme of the still lifes, this is a copy of a Zerber and that I did, uh, I guess I started that just after the uh, quarantine or the lockdown began back in March. That was a lot of fun. So I'm sorry, I'm sorry. sorry, it's a copy of who? Uh, a painter named Zerberan, who was a 17th century Spanish painter. This is a very, the original, a very famous painting to uh, still life painters, well, painters who love traditional still life. And uh, I had always wanted to copy it. And so the time off during the virus, 
I finally decided I would ease and do that which I had always said I would do. And so now I've got a Zerb around in my studio. Nice. Let's be back up here. So there's my bookshelf and some whatnot. And my back up here, a couple of figure paintings that I did. When did I do these? Uh, back um, in the, I probably started them in the fall and kept at them and finished them when, maybe February. I was talking to uh, Giovanni Casa earlier today, and <laughs> we were talking about this this landscape here, and he said, "You know, Paul, why don't you paint things a little bit smaller?" <laughs> and I had to laugh, but I told him, "I don't know why. Every time I start painting, I want it to be life size, and I can't seem to stop myself from doing that." And um, I know it has not been the most marketable kind of way of presenting painting. So here is another one of those garden scenes that I did at the same time as the one I just showed you. This is from a few years ago. But again, it was this that gave me a taste for picking flowers that I just find either in our garden or walking down the road and the sidewalks. And then this would be a painting that I did several years ago, which you see a very clear uh, uh, evidence of that kind of 17th century Spanish influence, that Zerberon influence. Is that a bagel? It is. Mm -hmm. I love that. I have never seen a bagel in such a dramatic scene. It's beautiful. Yeah. <sighs> and then this is a copy of a uh, sergeant, which is another painting I had always wanted to do and uh, decided to do it Again, while the virus was occurring, I did it as a demonstration. Okay, cool. Uh, what else? Um, it seems like you have a lot of uh, time to to work. Has the quarantine changed the way you work? I would have to say yes and no, Vita. So. Uh, it seemed to be that way at first. I thought, okay, great, you know, I've got all this time to paint, and so I will take advantage of it doing things like I was saying, copying the Zerberan and copying the sergeant. Um, and then slowly but surely, uh, life started to ebb back into my schedule uh, in one way or another, so I feel like, again, uh, I am always a little bit gnashing my teeth, feeling like I need to do more. Uh, there is a way that several, I know many painters who have stuck with it like I do, they all seem to have a certain, uh, not all of them, many of them, have this feeling that time is running out. You know, you've only got so much time and you've got to make the most of it. And no one else is going to make you do this. So if you are not self-imposing discipline and a schedule, it won't get done. Will that make a difference in the long term? No. But it does feel like it makes a difference to me. I drive my wife crazy with this because I'm always, you know, on edge that uh, anything else that is put on my plate, I tend to uh, push back against more with her than with other people. But um, I would say that I, even as I feel like I'm always not getting enough done and not spending enough time in the studio, when I do what we just did, and I look around at the paintings, I think, well, you know, they are accumulating here. It's not like I lack for work. I would say that these still lives that I'm saying now I would do in about three hours, I remember that first studio I had, that uh, unheated, no running water, space above a drugstore. I would work on one still life for five days. Um, just because that's how long it took me. You know, I was just exploring and finding out. My point being that now I'm much more efficient when I paint. I paint much faster, much more decisively. Uh, whether the painting works or not, I can produce it uh, much more expediently than I could have back then. So the irony is that in talking to other painters, the older you get, the less time there is to paint. And that is 
to me ironic because I always thought when I was in my early 20s, so someday I'll have uh, my career established where I paint the pictures, I take them to the gallery, they sell them, and, and more and more I have time to paint as this, this thing is established, this career. And you find out it's just the opposite, that between family, uh, you know, pursuing career opportunities, teaching, returning emails, mopping the kitchen floor, whatever, there seems to be less and less and less time to actually do the paintings. Um, that could be a misperception on my part. I was probably frittering away a lot more hours as a young person than I'm remembering now. But uh, I do feel that, as I say, just, just as you're saying, you say, boy, Paul, it looks like you're getting a lot done. Yeah. I wouldn't have said that. But then when I stop, I think, yeah, you know, that Zerberan copy, that, that, was, um, that was a handful. That took some time in the copying the sergeant. That's a lot of work. Um, and... I got it done, you know, over a period of a month or so, each one, less than that, really, and, um, and managed to do other things simultaneously. So I'm sure um, when my time is done, my daughter will wish that I painted a lot less, but uh, <laughs> I'm stuck with all these <laughs> paintings. Um, hopefully she has a very large house. <laughs> um, but in the meantime, uh, I have to say I'm very fortunate, you know, to have this studio right across the driveway from my house and to be able to do that which I love. Whenever I start to complain, I, I tell myself, stop it, you know, you're whining, <laughs> you are so lucky, so incredibly fortunate. Uh, I am to have this life where I am able to really have exactly what I wanted. Exact, and in a way, it's funny, I realized I wanted this from the time I was six years old. I didn't know that. I had no idea. All I wanted from the time I was six years old was to kind of be by myself. You know, to kind of not go to school, not be with a group all day. I didn't want to work with a group. I wanted to work by myself, and I wanted a contemplative life. I, again, I couldn't have known that when I was six, but that's the way I always was. And um, so that now through uh, my good fortune and making decisions that constantly led to that and having my family say, yes, this is okay. You know, my parents were all in support of me going to art school, uh, which was something I took for granted until I went to the academy and found that I was probably the only one in the school whose parents actually supported this idea. Um, so I was, in that sense, very blessed and uh, remind myself of that whenever I start to whine. Nice. Yeah, that's great. That's wonderful. It's good to be grateful uh, and feel blessed. That's a great feeling. Um, yeah. What draws you to your subject matter? Uh, I know you're working in the modes of like traditional still life, figure, landscape. Why do you think you approach painting this way? That's a good question. Um, I, I, you know, there's nature and nurture, I guess, in the sense of its exposure, I'm sure. Uh, I certainly have never thought of what I do as a political choice in any way, but I suppose there is a way I'm, that I definitely feel myself to be part of a Western cultural tradition of painting and How did I get that? I, I don't know. I think, I don't know. It would be hard to tease that out. But I would say that my influences, uh, as I mentioned, have, I have gravitated towards 16th and 17th century painting, mostly Spanish and Italian. I certainly love 17th century Dutch painting. I can't say that that influences what I do. I have had it mentioned several times with people looking at my still lives that they thought I was influenced by Manet. I have never been influenced by Manet. I like Manet a lot, but I never think of him when I'm painting. Not at all. Mm -hmm. um, 
which I can clearly see how they would thought that I had. And I say this because um, in preparation for that question, I realized that I'm, I'm really not influenced by 18th or 19th century painting at all, which doesn't mean that I dislike them. I love many aspects of them. It just doesn't inform my sensibilities. I feel like my sensibilities sort of leapfrog backwards all the way to the 17th century, to people like Zerberon, um, or Franz Hals, or Velasquez, or many other still life painters from the 17th century that just absolutely moved me to the soles of my feet. You know, the first time I saw them, I was just head over heels in love with this stuff. And so I would say through the time I went through PAPA, that four years, I don't think I ever opened a book on Impressionism. I just, I didn't, I didn't have time for that. You know, I was totally absorbed with that tonal painting, which to me was infinitely mysterious and infinitely profound. And, um, and I had never, it was all new to me. You know, I had seen Impressionist paintings. My, my parents had some art books, so I had saw some things, but I had never seen uh, a still life painting at all that had influenced me. So I remember discovering uh, painters like Zerberan, um, and there aren't a lot of them. It's, it's not easy to find them. There's been a lot more attention to them more recently. Um, but when I, when I did find them, I felt like I was discovering gold in the, in the creek, you know, after mining it for, for years, suddenly there it was, this thing that absolutely uh, felt like everything I had ever wanted was there, and I wanted to do that too. And those paintings, I do think about when I'm painting myself. Not necessarily a specific painting. I don't think, okay, this reminds me of X, Y, or Z. But it does remind me of, I set up my still lives looking for that feeling I had when looking at these 17th century paintings that inspired me. Um, and again, how did I get there? I don't know. I, to some extent, I want to say it's like, you know, why are my eyes the color they are? You know, you just, are you born with it? Maybe. Um, it's probably exposure. I think, you know, I think it's almost, I said politics. I think it's some, you know, I always curious, I'm curious to people, you know, how did you become a progressive or a conservative or whatever you think? You know, some of it may be family. You know, you might go, you, know, you, you might echo your parents' political opinions or you might totally reject them. Um, how did I get to be where I am? Um, I don't know. I mean, it, as I said, it was just those were the paintings that spoke to me and I followed my nose. And I definitely encourage students to do that too, to explore your influences and absolutely pull them towards you and embrace them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm curious to know, do you see any connection between still life and figure when you're painting? Uh, sometimes, yes. So that my interest uh, overridingly is in form, form and space. And while that's not so much what these florals are about, that is what the pears were about, for example, that I showed or the one that you mentioned with the bagel and the drape. Those paintings are very much about form and space and that tension that those two things in combination um, provoke in the imagination. And that's what the Zerberon painting is all about, is form and space and the drama of this light in space, this light object in the dark void. So when I'm painting a figure, or even a portrait, I'm also very much interested in form. There is a kind of fundamental aesthetic need and inspiration from that sense of that desire to express form and space. And when I've sort of reflected on this and where the hell that's coming from, you know, that's what we are as human beings. We're form and space. Here I am in this space and my form defines the space. Um, 
my relationship to the space is due to uh, my form and our relationship to each other as human beings in space is our form. So there's probably something about that, but I don't even need to analyze it. Um, at times, I remember seeing one of my still lives hanging on the wall and I was just sitting there looking at it and I thought, this is about the planets. <laughs> the still life, these whatever it was, I think it was a couple of squash, they were just all dark around them. And I thought it's all about, you know, the moon and the sky and the stone. This is this thing about these planetary relationships, maybe. Um, <laughs> I don't think that actually is quite it, but it could be. <laughs> and there is something interesting about that. I would say that we don't need as artists to explain this to ourselves, but it is something I'm always curious about. And I do remember uh, realizing once in reading an analysis of a poet's work, finally it occurred to me that what I was doing with these uh, fruits and squashes and flowers in the dark void, if we could sum it up, we could say it was the ephemeral moment of life suspended in the dark void of eternity. Mm. And that sounds a little grandiose, but that's what it is. That, that's what these things were. And it's not important that I can articulate that. It's not important that I think about that, but that's what, the, that's what was moving me in the Zerberon. Nice. And the other influence that I had was a, a mentor when I was at the Academy from 81 to 85, Arthur DaCosta. And his still lives were very influential to me. And he was pursuing that theme as well. His figure paintings were also influential to me. And uh, that was certainly, other than my parents and my grandparents, my relationship to Arthur was the most profound relationship in my development as a human being, as a person. And so that was very fortunate to have discovered, uh, to have that privilege, again, that very good fortune of having that person who um, knew everything that I wanted to know as I saw it, knew everything that I wanted to know, and I was going to get it out of him. <laughs> um, and we, we had tremendous, uh, a tremendous, uh, sympathy of taste so that um, without ever knowing it, <clears throat> oftentimes until years later, I would realize when he would say something that we shared a deep love of one painting or one artist or similar opinions about things that um, really made it feel like, um, like a marriage. That, that's not quite the right word for it, but uh, a very, um, a like very, a partnership. Well, it wasn't a partnership and that we weren't working towards some, it was a very fruitful relationship for my personal development. And um, now looking back, I, I always felt that I learned everything from Arthur. And now looking back, I can't really be sure what I learned from him and what I learned on my own because of what he had taught me. So in other words, I'm still learning. You're, you continue to learn forever as an artist and I suppose as a human being. Um, but I think how I learn now was informed by all those conversations with Arthur and all his teaching. That's amazing to have a person like that in your life. Yeah. It, it was extremely fortunate. That's great. Um, last time we uh, were having a conversation on your last webinar when we were doing a uh, demonstration of a portrait um, and we talked about sensitivity and you define sensitivity as love. Um, how do you, can you speak a little bit about that in regards to painting? Because we sort of talked about it in regards to drawing and that sensitivity is a little bit different uh, since it's lacking color, for example and application of paint. Can you talk a little bit about that in terms of painting? In terms of? Painting. The, the question of love. And sensitivity. What is sensitivity? 
and how is it a little bit different or is it a different than it is in terms of drawing? Well, there are certainly the, the sensitivity uh, in any art form is extraordinarily important. It's 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 the only thing that makes for an artwork being special. So that I would say that talent is not really that rare, and talent alone is not special. Uh, sensitivity is more rare, and there are infinite levels of sensitivity. And so when you can combine sensitivity with capability, talent, um, then you have the capacity for achieving something exceptional. Exceptional as a moment that defines human consciousness, which is what art does. It makes us conscious of what it is to be alive, what it is to be a human being, what it is to, in our case, painting, perceive the world through our eyes. What is that like? What is the experience of it? And it's not about accuracy. So what I always say to students is, I am not interested in you being very accurate. That is fine and well. And it is true that while as we attempt to be accurate, we are in a sense definitely developing greater sensitivity. However, it is very possible to be extremely accurate and have nothing specially sensitive about the work of art. It is uh, conversely or inversely possible to have a piece of artwork that is not particularly accurate, but is tremendously sensitive. That piece is still exceptional, even without the accuracy. It's rare that that's going to happen because someone who's that sensitive wants, um, and when I say accuracy, I mean they get what they're after. Um, and what they're after is to express being moved by the awareness of love. That's what it is. It's, it's you know, I always think of portraits. Um, great portraits are all about love. This is not a love for the individual. It is a love for the beauty of a face. And when I say the beauty of a face, I don't mean it has to be a pretty face. Just the beauty of an iris, the beauty of, of uh, an earlobe, or anything, anything. Um, and for me, the beauty of those things seen in, in, a, in a particular light, so that um, I am moved by my light source and most any damn thing you put in it. Um, but of course, then I'm making choices about what I put in it and arranging them. But art is about a discovery of consciousness, about being made aware through the expression of the artist. And uh, what I want to be aware of, what I want to uh, constantly be trying to develop in myself is uh, a very distinctive and growing being moved by my subject matter. So that when I'm painting that stuff, and, and by the subject matter, I mean, it could be just a color, just a particular color in a particular place can be tremendously moving. A shape could be tremendously moving. It's, it's not about associations necessarily. So that, again, a great portrait painter could, has, has no better chance of making a great painting of someone they love than someone they don't know at all. That's, it's not, that, that's not the kind of love I'm talking about. And um, when I am arranging my still life, I am definitely trying to keep uh, exploring the boundaries of my imagination. And my imagination is very well educated by looking at paintings um, 
for years and years, copying paintings, studying this subject, knowing it, so that I know in myself when I am reaching beyond what I know, reaching beyond what I've experienced before, as opposed to painting something that is familiar to me as an imaginative reaction. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm always trying to do, and that can be hard because of course, it feels good to say, oh, this reminds me of a painting that I've seen that I loved and I'm gonna stop there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love this notion of love as um, a subject matter almost. This, this, it's, it's a kind well, it's of- not a subject matter. It's, I would say it's a theme, Vito. You know? The subject matter is the stuff. The theme is, is what the subject matter does to the imagination. Mm -hmm. So it's a theme yeah. of what I would say. There's a kind of real presentness with it, uh, it feels to me, that you really have to be there in the moment and open to your subject, whether it's the still life or the figure, um, and really be able to sort of see it and feel it uh, in many ways, to be sensitive to it. Um, quick question, do you work in oils primarily yeah. or both oil and acrylic? No, I, I work in oils exclusively. I've never, um, I've always felt like that was, a, you know, gave, gave me everything I needed. And I'm always amazed when I look at monographs of artists and they did paintings and they did etchings and they did watercolors. And I think, wow, how did they have all the time for that? Um, I, I feel like I am, I do some drawings, but I feel like I have a full plate just expressing myself with the oil paint. Mm hmm um, can you also talk a little bit about the role of color in your work? Do you have a special palette? Um, or do, do you feel like you have a palette or a certain affinity to certain colors or a certain palette? Yes. So it's been generally my understanding uh, that the more interested an artist is in form, the more compressed their palette will be. And mm. the less interested the artist is in form as a uh, theme, as a, a mode of expression, the, usually the broader their color effects are, or, or rather the more plural and the more vivid. So that um, if you think, the way I'm talking about it would be that uh, to be interested in form is to have a kind of fundamental relationship, um, not conscious, but unconscious, to a kind of sculptural mode of, of expression. So that, um, again, just to think of my still lives or the figures or portraits, um, I'm very much interested in form and space the more plural the color effect gets, it risks distracting from the poignancy of that theme of the form. Make sense? Yeah, totally. It does so feel like the current still lives of the colorful flowers then are a little bit of a departure. Exactly. From I, that. Thought thing. I thought, well, what's up with this? Why am I doing this? Um, and it's true. So that I would say that with the flowers, there is um, I want to say it's a kind of maturing in that they are definitely still very much, very much about defining space and forming space, but the sophistication, so to speak, that comes into play is now the forms have become extremely delicate. And, um, and to even make that more poignant, I have increased the size of the space around those very delicate objects. Mm. Um, now, I didn't really, I, I didn't rationalize it like that, just that's the first time I've ever expressed it verbally. And I don't, again, I don't need to do that. As artists, you don't need to explain yourself right. to yourself, um, but it does go through your head, like, well, why the hell am I doing this? Um, but I think that there is, there are certainly issues of shape involved 
and and that's all I can say is that, that somehow this is a situation where those otherwise very sculptural forms have become very delicate and to me there is a way of that as I was saying before you know for me it's like this uh, uh, exploring the like really of my own imagination mm -hmm. into a form and space with the forms conceived of in an entirely different way. Gotcha. Yeah, and it feels like color in some respect is part of this um, investigation in terms of the delicacy of the form. How does, how do you communicate that and it feels the color is just looking at the painting behind you is is an important part of that dialogue that you're having yes i would say that's true and just as you said that it, it clicked off in my head that part of the reason for that is that um with those paintings that we talked about earlier the ones you were mentioning where i had the dark backgrounds and i have the drama of the very light object against the very dark void. So we have that dramatic effect uh, coming into play with that contrast of light and dark and form and space. If we don't have um, strong contrasts um, with something like the flowers, then how do they become, um, I'm gonna say impactful? Through color. Mm-hmm, yeah, makes sense. And of course, it just happens to be that that's the way they are. You know, I, I decided that I want this ephemeral, this, you know, the, 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 the ephemeral theme is huge. That's very important. Um, and so flowers are the ultimate expression of that. And they happen to mostly be quite colorful. Yeah, yeah, but you are selecting them. And so I am selecting them, that's true. The and I think you're making. Um, some of these flowers, I would have never dreamed that I'd be painting them 20 years ago. Or when I was a student, I would have never dreamed that I would have painted something like this. Not because I disliked it, but um, I don't know. It's just, it's just a new wrinkle for me. Yeah. And it's been a lot um, of fun. Yeah, it's exciting to be venturing into something new. Paul, can you talk at all about um, the intersection between your art practice and your teaching practice, and if, if there is one? Um, yeah, I think there is. Um, well, first of all, teaching is very important to me in one very um, simple human way, which is it is uh, my, my, my time in my classes each week are the most interaction I have with other people, other than my wife and my daughter. So that, you know, I've, once or twice I thought, oh, wouldn't it be nice someday if I just had all week to paint, I didn't have to teach classes, and immediately a shudder goes through me and I think, my God, I'd be totally isolated. And I would have, uh, because my students are a big part of my conversations each week, things I do outside the studio, friendships, um, all kinds of things. My community uh, is mostly my students, and I love that. Um, in terms of how the teaching relates to my painting itself, I would say that it it makes me more thoughtful about what I'm doing when I'm doing it, so that I start to. Um, when I'm teaching and I'm coming to um, coming up to a student and commenting on their painting, I've got to analyze, okay, how, what is it that they're not understanding and how am I going to make them understand that? And I've got to go through it. Um, you know, it's a very nonverbal thing, painting. So how is it that I can understand where I've been there myself? and had that misunderstanding, um, and how I learned to get past it. Um, basically, there's a way, what I'm saying is that teaching makes me have to be able to analyze how I do what I do when I'm painting, 
and be able to communicate it to the student, which means that I have to be articulate enough to be clear to them. I don't want to speak in metaphor to them. I don't think that really gets you there. You know, I mean, the student needs to know how to do this. Um, and, and, there, and this is a, a, a physical thing. You know, we hold the brush, we mix the color, we apply it. Uh, this, is, this can be talked about, and it doesn't mean that that's gonna limit the expression, but I wanna be able to say it clearly so that they can understand, as I'm saying, this otherwise nonverbal thing. And as we know, when we can put language to something, thoughts immediately become much clearer. Mm -hmm. And so if I can talk to them about the way I'm visually experiencing the painting, then that helps them to uh, be able to have that similar kind of understanding of their own reaction. And getting back to what I was saying about having a mentor, Arthur DaCosta, Arthur was brilliant at that. He was very good and an extraordinary example of being able to verbalize his reaction to a painting. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, having taught in the past and in thinking about how it relates to my own art practice, it's certainly that verbalization and putting putting a, a, what I do that is so intuitive and automatic into words makes it so much more intentional and so much more clear to me to myself. Um, and that I always found to be really special about being a teacher as well as an artist. So that's cool. Um, yeah, that, the one last thing I would say about teaching and uh, painting myself is, um, again, how fortunate I am. I wanna say there's almost nothing I, I love more than painting. And so this gives me another opportunity to share with other people this art form that I love and just have the opportunity to talk about it. And, and, and to talk about it with people who also love it and want to learn more and are hungry to learn about this as well. And that's uh, very fortunate. Indeed. Um, do you let your students work in acrylic? Yes. I, I, my thought is the students can work in whatever medium they want in the classroom. The, the fundamentals that I'm trying to teach apply to any medium. Um, I do find that acrylics are oftentimes more difficult. They dry on the palette very quickly. And um, usually I find that students, after watching the demonstration and other students working in oils, they start thinking about converting themselves pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. I think that the oils, the cleanup is, is more time consuming, but the, the cost of the acrylic convenience is, um, they don't interest me personally, but, but students are welcome to work in acrylic in my classes, yes. Okay, great. Um, one last question, we're almost out of time. Uh, have you ever taught still life at Fleischer and would you plan or do you plan to teach still life in the future? You know, you usually just teach figure and portrait, right? Yes. Now, I did teach still life at Fleischer. Uh, I think it must have been in the summer and it was when I first began teaching there many years ago and I don't know how it evolved. I evolved out of that. I don't remember. Um, so I don't have an answer about what the future holds, but I did teach it many years ago at Fletcher. Yeah, maybe in the future, do still like, why not? Switch it up. Okay, well, it's almost 7.30. If there are no other questions, Paul, thank you so much for taking your time with us and for showing us your space, inviting us into your space, talking about your work. It was really educational and really wonderful to spend the evening with you. Um, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, really great to see so many familiar faces. Um, join us tomorrow for a painting intuitively demonstration with Doa Lee, one of our faculty members. 
Um, and next week, we'll also have a whole slew of events that you can check out on our calendar page. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, everyone. And have a great evening. Stay safe. Bye, Paul. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Take care. Bye-bye.